Super. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar series. This is the third of six of our spring webinar series, um, and we are the CFIDS Association of America, brought to you to leverage patient-centered research to cure MECFS. Today's webinar is going to be kind of picking apart the phrase safe and effective treatment. I'm going to be the host of this particular webinar, which again is our third of six in our spring webinar series. And Kim McCleary, President and CEO of the CFIDS Association, is going to be doing her English major kind of stuff and breaking down safe and effective treatment for us and really digging down and uh, hopefully explaining it so that it becomes crystal clear to all of us. So again, this is the third um, of six weekly webinar programs that we're going to run uh, through May 9th. And we put these in place to really help um, our community, all of our constituents, uh, learn, become very informed about how to participate and, and ultimately um, take action in a number of opportunities that are available to all of us. The first one that's on our radar and really what these webinar series are meant to prepare us all for is the FDA workshop on drug development for CFS and ME, which will occur on April 25 and 26, a couple weeks away. And that will be live broadcast for or webcast for those of you that aren't able to attend in person. And we have heard that the attendance is really getting up there with representatives from um, the clinical world, the patient world, the pharma world, and the academic world. So it should be an outstanding first kickoff meeting in this series of meetings that the FDA is, is holding, um, the first one being, again, for CFS and, and ME. The next specific CFS event is happening with, um, on May 22nd and 23rd, and that is the Federal CFS Advisory Committee. Again, this will also be webcast. Is that right, Kim? It will be webcast? They are usually webcast. They haven't made the announcement about this one in particular, but when they have not webcast them live in the past, they've gotten a lot of uh, feedback about that, so I expect it will be. Okay. And this should be a really interesting um, CFS Advisory Committee meeting because this is the first meeting where the, um, the patient advocacy organizations will be participating. I think there are three that have been put in place on the advisory committee, including us, the CFITS Association. Another opportunity to participate is with some uh, patient-focused surveys. And we have conducted one of these surveys, and to date, the, the URL, I think, has been posted regularly on our Facebook page and on Research First. Uh, we have about 1,000, as of this morning, 1,152 participants that have responded so far. I mean, it's just been a phenomenal response rate for this very important survey, which will help inform the FDA about what is important to the CFSME population. Um, 88, interestingly, 88% of the respondents have been diagnosed with ME-CFS by a provider. And another interesting point is that only 18% of patients that respond have ME-CFS as their only diagnosis and, and, and or medical issue. So this is a, just an example of two of the 27 questions that are asked in the survey, many of them are open-ended, so you can, you can write to your heart's content to really give us the information and the FDA the information that you have been wanting to give, you want them to hear, and, and really provide a great opportunity for your voice to be heard. Um, 
All of our webinars um, are recorded and then they are posted on the Solve CFS YouTube channel and they're highly accessed channel so you can, if you get tired of listening to us, you can always come back and listen to us later um, or if you want to uh, hear something that you haven't heard or might be of interest, check out the YouTube channel for some of these other uh, recordings that we have there. There's a lot of resources that we have um, on the Research First website, lots of reviews, lots of references, and um, a lot of expert posts and blog posts um, from Kim and myself um, on the Research First website. And the questions that you've submitted when you registered for these webinars are very useful for us in helping us not only get better webinars, but shape the program and give us ideas for what um, you might want to be want to hear in the future or be interested in. So our first program in this spring webinar series was given by Kristen Snayman, the program director at Faster Cures. And it was a fascinating, um, really cutting edge webinar that talks about this gap between the laboratory and the bedside. And she told us how, um, really kind of gave us the description of how the, the process, how we, can, how we can work to bridge this process between the bench and the bedside we can make laboratory discoveries ultimately affect the patients much more efficiently. This recording is up and available on our Solve YouTube, uh, Solve CFS YouTube channel, so please take a listen to it. It's, a, it's just very, very good stuff and it, it really does um, describe some of the cutting edge translational, how the cutting edge translational research is being done like organizations such as ours. What, what um, Kristen talked about was this drug development pipeline. Bottom line of this is that each year there are between 5 and 10,000, 5,000 and 10,000 compounds, molecules in the, that are at the beginning of this drug discovery pipeline and ultimately only one of those makes it to an FDA approved drug. So this is a, a a pipeline that right now organizations like ours and Faster Cures are working to figure out how to optimize and in fact we are optimizing it. Last week was our second program in our spring webinar series and that was finding your strongest voice for public testimony. Um, that was our new engagement and communications director Lee Reynolds, um, new to our staff as of January and that was hosted by uh, Kim McCleary and and what and again this this recording is also available on our YouTube channel and what Lee um, helped us to understand was really finding your voice and really expressing it and talking about it and providing information in such a way that it really does it really is heard, really. It's really effectively heard. The reason that this is important is because of the FDA's patient-focused drug develop initiative. Again, this is the um, we, the CFS ME community, are the first in the series of uh, meetings over the next five years that the FDA will, will host. Um, this particular uh, initiative is mandated under the PDUFA Act um, that was renewed in, in July 2012. PDUFA stands for the Pre Prescription Drug User Fee Act and it will be at least 20 disease specific meetings, CFS being the first one. I mean we have the coveted position of the first meeting so this will be um, it's super exciting time for us in the MECFS world. The format for each of these workshops is relatively standard. 
but they will have some variable components depending on the specific disease um, that is covered. And, and Lee really talked to us about how to be most effective in all of the communication opportunities that we have um, to help inform the FDA. Just this morning, the, in the Federal Register, the FDA uh, selected, it, it issued this announcement um, of, I think it's 16 of the 20 diseases that they will be hosting these workshop for, workshops for over the next uh, four or five years, I think. Well, this, this shows two years. <clears throat> three. And you'll see here, what's that? It's the first set for the first three years, and they'll announce the second set sometime in 2015, I think. Okay. Okay. And there's 16 on here, you said, right? Yes. Okay. And you note in um, orange, myalgic encephalomyelitis, MECFS is on here, and so is fibromyalgia. So these um, are going to be very, very interesting um, meetings. And if you go to the Federal Registry, and we'll provide that, that URL towards the um, end of the meeting, where Kim will be sending out uh, the URL, right, Kim? Yes, yes. Which will describe the rationale, the reasoning that the FDA used for selecting all of these diseases listed here. There were 4,500 comments submitted to the FDA recommending 90 different disease areas. So uh, this is a truly competitive process to get on the list and especially to be first. So the entire MECFS community really should celebrate this victory. And the entire MECFS community is, should be commended for everything that, that we've done to, to get us here in this coveted spot. So today's program is going to deal with the phrase safe and effective treatment. What does that really mean? How do we get a molecule discovered at one end of the whole discovery process all the way to the other end where it has, it's finally in the hands of the physician and the patients to be able to use safe and effectively to treat, in our case, MECFS. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Kim McCleary, CEO and President of the CFIDS Association, now going on 22 years, our fearless and wonderful leader. Take it away, Kim. Thank you, Suzanne. And for those um, of you who don't recognize uh, the voice you've been hearing for the first 15 minutes of our program, that was Dr. Suzanne Vernon, our scientific director, <laughs> and uh, the Thelma to my Louise, or the Louise to my Thelma. We haven't quite sorted that out yet. I guess um, I didn't even introduce myself, did I? <laughs> you need no introduction. <laughs> so the, the reason that um, I in particular wanted to share this information with the community today is um, that over the course of the last year, it has really become very clear to me how important these six little words are um, that are showing on the screen, safe and effective treatment for MECFS. We sort of get maybe numb to the term safe and effective um, because in the United States, one of two countries in the world that allows direct-to-consumer advertisement, if you watch any live television at all, especially uh, during the day, you're sort of flooded with uh, advertisements about different pharmaceutical products and all of them have to um, comply with certain FDA regulations to explain the treatment and all of the side effects and all the adverse events. And uh, they do it in a way that kind of um, really underplays what those side effects and, and adverse events could be. You might see um, two mature adults riding bicycles while they talk about you know, the potential for blindness and bleeding and all kinds of um, 
horrible sounding uh, symptoms that might occur as a result of this treatment, but the visual never is matched to the words. So we therefore so, sort of just tune out this idea of safe and effective treatment, yet it is the key for all of the decisions that FDA makes anywhere along the, um, the path from the left side of this infographic that FDA uh, has on its site all the way to the right side, which, as Suzanne said, puts the treatment in the hands of the patient and, and his or her physician, or in some cases out on the uh, shelves at your local pharmacy or grocery store, um, and keeps it there, importantly. Uh, drugs do get recalled and pulled from the shelves, and um, safe and effective is really the phrase that guides everything from this point, uh, before and after the, the infographic here. So what I'm going to do is, is, as Suzanne said, break down each one of these terms so that it helps um, our community understand how their experience will shape the FDA's understanding of how this phrase um, is interpreted by people who live and experience MECFS on a daily basis. And I'm actually going to start from the right. I know uh, all of us uh, in English, at least, we're used to reading left to right, but the phrase really makes more sense if we start and go right to left. Uh, so let's see if I can make this work. So the first part of that being MECFS, and uh, there's no shortage of opinions and controversy and tension around what we call this condition or uh, how we define it. And without getting bogged down in that, which is something the FDA says it will not do because it's really um, an issue that's left to the sponsor of a particular drug therapy and the clinical studies that go with it, they are being inclusive. And um, you know, MECFS, they're using that term. You saw it in the Federal Register notice. Um, they have also used MENCFS or CFSNME. They're being sort of agnostic about the label and the definition. So this term is really meant here to reflect CFS is defined by the 94 FACUTA definition, MECFS is defined by the Canadian uh, clinical case definition of 2003, the newer ME definition, um, the international uh, case definition that was published um, most recently. There are older ME definitions that could be used, and then within each of these different definitions are subtypes. And you might have um, post-exertional malaise and uh, acute onset as a defined subtype of any of these conditions, uh, the CFS Bakuda, in, in, for instance. Um, but it, again, it's really up to the drug sponsor to decide how they are going to define the condition, how they're going to recruit the patients that will be studied, and how they're going to um, set the criteria for the labeling for the drug once it would be uh, submitted for approval. So FDA won't get into this, but they are trying to be inclusive about the whole process. So Kim, one thing that the FDA will do is when an investigator comes with a study protocol for a new indication for CFS is they will make sure that you understand what the criteria are for your particular study regarding case definitions and how they're defined and how what types of individuals are eligible, et cetera. So they, they will work with you to make sure that your protocol is as sound as possible. Absolutely. So if we move uh, to the next step left, the word for seems trivial and like it's um, Maybe not one that we need to look at very closely, but actually it is. Oh, what am I doing? Sorry, operator error there. Um, it actually is important because when the FDA looks at a drug um, and considers it to treat a particular condition, you have to do studies that are looking at that condition. You can't just take a drug that's been approved for MS and try to get it approved for MECFS without doing the studies on that particular population um, or a specific subgroup of people with that diagnosis. 
So it does end up being a key word. The word treatment seems sort of obvious, um, but it actually has layers to it as well. So in, in talking about treatments, you could think of new compounds. And on that pipeline that um, Suzanne showed that Kristen had shared with us two weeks ago, you can start all the way on the left-hand side of that with new compounds, new chemicals that um, have not been introduced into humans or animals for study yet. Uh, that are simply mixed up in a test tube or a petri dish or some other uh, piece of laboratory equipment. And that would be a new compound that has to start all the way at the left-hand side of that and move to the right. You could look at existing compounds, so things that have been perhaps tested in another condition but weren't, a, weren't valuable, didn't pan out, um, or have been sitting on the shelves and have been used many years ago and perhaps aren't no longer on the market. Um, you could also look at approved compounds. So this would be drugs or other um, compounds that are already available and on the shelves or uh, either behind the counter or in front of the counter for other conditions that then kind of start at about the halfway point of that pipeline and move from the halfway point to the right. So you get a little bit of a shortcut effect. And there's a big interest in, in this. It's called drug repurposing or drug repositioning. And um, we have been involved uh, in a very exciting project with BioVista, a small biotech firm um, that's part of our research institute without walls. And Suzanne will be talking about drug repurposing at the FDA meeting. And that's specifically why we haven't include, included a, a talk about uh, drug repurposing in this webinar series, because uh, she'll cover that at the uh, FDA meeting. There are also um, biologics that are used in the treatment of conditions. And this can be uh, things like gamma globulin. It's not a drug per se. It's a biologic that's manufactured from substances in the human body. There are also devices. Um, devices are really kind of hot right now. There's a lot of investigation into different types of pacemakers. Um, if you think of a pacemaker, you tend to go to cardiology and think, well, that's what somebody with a heart problem needs to keep their heart uh, beating uh, and functioning properly at the right cadence and speed and, and force. But there are also pacemakers in the brain now. Um, they're used in epilepsy and being tested in Parkinson's disease and other neurologic conditions. There are things like um, ultrasound. Um, there are you know, other devices that um, do different types of uh, waves into the brain being used in depression and pain. So devices is an area that hasn't really gotten much attention in the MECFS community, but I think it's something that we will hear more and more about, especially as some of the neurologic conditions and the pain conditions um, become uh, greater topics for uh, device manufacturers to get involved with. Hey, and Kim, does, yeah. does um, devices also include, like, um, now these mobile devices, the, um, like the wristbands, like the up from jaw, um, jawbone? Or so all of, all of the consumer devices that people are using and what's called the, um, oh, gosh, why am I at, like, at Quantified self? Quantified self, thank you. The quantified self movement. So a lot of people are wearing... Uh, Fitbits to monitor how many steps they take each day as part of a weight loss or healthy uh, activity plan. Um, there are sleep monitors. There are monitors for the heart. Um, FDA regulates those, but I think there's a different process because they aren't uh, interventions. They're more on the monitoring side. Um, so they may not be considered under treatment, but there is an FDA regulatory process, even for apps on your phone, believe it or not. Um, one statistic that Kristen gave us uh, in the first webinar of the series was that FDA regulates 25 cents of every consumer dollar spent um, because they regulate not only drugs and therapies, but also things like cell phones and pet food that you would, wouldn't necessarily think about. And then the last stop point here under treatment is other modalities. Um, so things like physical therapy, um, uh, pain management that may not involve pharmaceuticals are considered treatment, although not 
all of those things are regulated by the FDA. The FDA doesn't have to um, regulate things like uh, physical therapy, I think, is a, is a good example. Um, those are really in place more um, like other clinical modalities where the standards and the guidelines are really enforced by the profession themselves. But an important thing to keep in just in mind as we think about the totality and the holistic view of treatment for ME-CFS. Okay, moving over to the, the words that people are most interested in, um, the word effective. So when FDA looks at whether a treatment is effective in a particular condition, they need to understand the symptoms of that condition, what the current treatment available is, um, the expectations that the patient has. So uh, for those of you that have completed our survey or responded to the FDA docket um, with the questions that were asked in preparation for this uh, workshop coming up in two weeks, one of the things that, that FDA is really interested in is what symptom do you want most to, to have relieved or improved or to have some noticeable impact in your life? And that's because they're going to think about that. When a, when a sponsor comes in on the left-hand side of that pipeline, they're going to want to make sure that that drug is really going after something that's important to the patient. Um, so understanding the expectations that the patient community for that condition has about its treatment is an important part of that uh, effective statement. Um, natural history. The, the illness begins in one way, often in a very acute fashion, and then may take several different courses that are sometimes quite individualized over the course of years, uh, particularly in a chronic illness like MECFS. And it's important to have some understanding, even though we don't we don't fully um, you know hasn't been fully researched and documented, and certainly not enough long-term studies have been done to understand what is expected to happen to the individual over time as a consequence of their illness so that that can be factored in to the clinical study of the illness. Um, if certain symptoms persist, it's important for the FDA and the sponsor to be able to sort out whether that's part of the natural history of the illness and perhaps not amenable to treatment or whether um, you know, that, that's a factor that should be looked at when they're trying to decide whether this treatment worked or not. The issue of drug resistance is a really interesting uh, issue, and, and we held a scientific meeting from our Research Institute Without Walls last fall, and one of the uh, individuals who came to that meeting spoke to this issue of drug resistance. Um, and what they're finding in depression is that the more treatments you try, the less effective any of them will be, and that the body seems to build up over time a resistance to therapies, even different therapies, over time. And as we know in MECFS in particular, because there is no established therapy or therapeutic protocol, people have to go through a lot of trial and error with this illness. And knowing that background um, may be important as the clinical studies uh, ramp up to look at specific treatments, knowing what the background of treatment resistance might be in this um, patient population. Drug metabolism is similar with all of the uh, sequencing of the human genome and a better understanding about how genes get turned on and off and how that affects the body's ability to metabolize drugs. Something called pharmacogenetics is becoming increasingly important. And in our last two webinars, we had several questions from people uh, interested in this topic of pharmacogenetics. And um, Susanna, if, correct me if I'm wrong, I think there are some 90 drugs on the market right now that have identified in their label uh, different pharmacogenetic subtypes that either are highly uh, responsive to a particular medicine or that don't metabolize it well and therefore it becomes sort of a, a contraindication that if you have this particular um, genetic makeup, you should not take a specific drug or you know expect that it's probably not going to work for you. That's exactly correct. I think it's around 100, and, and there's a s substantial number in that list of 100 that have 
specific genes and polymorphisms on the label that are used in ME-CFS populations and obviously with, with variable efficacy. So this is an area that we are very interested in and have tried to encourage some research in in our request for applications that we've issued um, over the last few years. We have sort of stuck this idea in as um, maybe a tickler for a scientist who does pharmacogenomics work to look at this population. Our sort of working hypothesis is that there might be a particular um, drug metabolism issue with MECFS patients, and that may be contributing to the rather um, stubborn nature of the illness when it comes to symptomatic treatment, and also the fact that most patients report that they are only able to tolerate very small doses of medications that are otherwise pretty well tolerated. So I think we'll, again, continue to hear more about this particular issue, and it may be an important um, factor as new treatments are, are tested um, for uh, ME-CFS in particular. We and actually the, got some, some nibbles on that tickler that we put out, Kim, and, and from a relatively large HMO. So um, we're very interested in pursuing leads like this to see what type of applicability and impact pharmacogenetics has in the MECFS populations. Yep. I think it's a big issue that hasn't been, uh, hasn't been tackled yet. Yep. The last point under effective is uh, the placebo effect. In, in every condition and in every drug trial, there are a certain number of people who will receive um, in a controlled trial where half of or a portion of the study participants receive the active substance and a portion receive an inactive substance called a placebo. The people in the placebo arm, some number of them will improve in a very similar way to the people in the active arm of the treatment uh, trial. And that seems to vary somewhat with the different conditions. And, um, you know, there have been some mixed studies in MECFS showing that people have a higher rate of uh, response to placebo, and then also in other studies that it's a lower rate. But understanding that, again, is, is part of knowing um, whether a drug is effective or not, because the thing that the sponsor has to show is that the drug works better than the placebo. And if there is an unusual placebo effect at play, it could make it harder or easier to tell whether the drug is working when compared to a placebo. And also knowing if the placebo is, um, it, it may have some effect on its own. If we think about the Amplgen example, Amplgen was an IV therapy um, given three times a week over a long uh, six-month period. And the individuals in the placebo part of that study received IV saline um, three times a week over the same six months, thinking that uh, you know neither the participant nor the clinician knew which substance was being given. But ironically, IV saline is used um, as a therapy for um, attending to the orthostatic problems that many people with MECFS experience. So it could be that the, the um, results that were shown in the Amplgen study where, it, depending on how you cut the data, the placebo arm did in some cases just as well as the treatment arm, it could have been a beneficial effect of the IV saline and not just, uh, you know, it wouldn't have been the same if they had compared it to nothing at all. Um, but anyway, understanding that placebo effect is obviously important. And all this leads to is what the outcome measures for a particular drug study are. Um, outcome measures are the way that the sponsor predicts or, or dis decides at the beginning of the study they are going to show the drug works. And outcome measures can really fall into three categories. There are laboratory measures, clinical measures, and patient-reported measures. And I'll just kind of briefly describe those. So a laboratory measure would be something that can be um, measured in the lab. Uh, so if we're thinking about a cancer therapy, it might be the size of the tumor or a particular marker, um, a, num a cell subset measure, a viral load. 
things like that that can be measured in a laboratory. A clinical measure is something measured in the clinic. So in the Ampligen study, and using that as an example again, the outcome measure that hemispherics chose at the beginning of the study was how much time a patient could spend on a treadmill test. Uh, so that was a clinical measure because it's not a laboratory, but something that the physician uh, observed and recorded, and there were observations uh, at different points along the study um, to see how well the patient was responding to the drug based on how long they could stay on the treadmill. The third kind of outcome measure is a patient-reported outcome measure. Um, and these patient-reported outcome measures are kind of softer, uh, quote unquote, in a way, than the laboratory or clinical measure because they rely on the patient's own experience and observation about how they're feeling and how their symptoms are affecting their life. And so it's use of things like survey instruments, um, tools like the Fitbit, how many uh, steps they can climb in a day, how many steps they take in a day. Um, but what is actually happening is the FDA is putting more emphasis on patient-reported outcome measures than they have in the past, which I think is a very good thing for, C for ME-CFS. And the reason they're doing that is because many of the treatments that have been approved for other conditions, and again, I'll use cancer as an example, where there is a laboratory measure as the outcome of the study, um, a particular cell subset uh, decreases let's say, with treatment X, it may or may not have any effect on the patient's life. Their quality of life, their ability to engage in everyday activities may or may not be improved if the measurement of a certain cell set changes over time. And um, although it is not part of the FDA's responsibility, the insurers at the end of the pipeline, on the other side, on the far right-hand side, are saying, you know, I'm not sure I want to pay for this $300,000 a year cancer treatment if my patient that I'm insuring doesn't have a better quality of life and can therefore not return to his or her full activities. So show me some patient-reported outcomes that are going to demonstrate the value of this particular treatment to me as the insurer. So the FDA is kind of looking at this more on the front end, and we see um, MECFS as a perfect scenario for the implementation of patient-reported outcome measures. And uh, we're working very diligently to, uh, with several um, partners on, on trying to get some of those established and validated. I'm going to jump way over to the left and talk about safe, and then we'll come back to the word and, um, and break that down as well. So safe, safety in the regulatory framework um, looks at the dose of a medication that you take, the side effects that that medication might have, and those are things that occur uh, you know, within a certain time frame of taking the medication. So. If you take a medication and your tongue swells up or you get a rash on your hands within, you know, an hour or a day of taking that medication, that's considered a side effect. An adverse event is uh, kind of like a side effect, but it may be observed over a longer period of time or it may be much more um, serious. And there are adverse events and also serious adverse events, SAEs, that the FDA looks at um, in determining whether a drug is safe. And an adverse event might be an increased risk of death, um, a higher rate of cancer, a higher rate of heart disease. Um, if you think of some of the pain medications, Celebrex and other things that have made it into the news, um, they were pulled not because of their side effects, but because of the adverse events that occurred over a period of time after, after treatment uh, was begun. Kim, even things like pain and fatigue are con considered adverse events. Yes, yes. So, um, you know, beta blockers are a classic uh, that um, fatigue is present both as a side effect and as an adverse event. Um, and then the interactions with drugs that are part of a patient's um, kind of arsenal um, 
either for treating that condition or other conditions that might be present. So if you've got um, a heart disease drug and you've got a patient, you've got you know, a particular kind of heart disease that often falls with um, type 2 diabetes, you have to understand when, a, when evaluating the heart disease drug, how it will interact with other medications that that patient population is typically prescribed. Um, so all of these issues together help form the safety profile of a particular drug. And I'm going to move to and. And the most important thing about the word and is that when the FDA looks at a particular treatment, you have to have all of these things. And means both. And doesn't mean one or the other. A safe treatment for MECFS is not going to make it through regulatory approval unless they can also show that it's effective. And an effective drug, if it's unsafe, is not going to make it through regulatory approval. And what's been very interesting as uh, I've been privileged to participate in the process of planning um, this series of 20 FDA workshops is how different the interpretation of safe and effective is depending on which condition you're talking about. And that's really um, these pieces, the safe and effective part, really combine to form a risk benefit tolerance profile for a particular condition. So FDA evaluates all of these things but they put them in the context of the condition being studied. So we're back to this right-hand part of um, the, the phrase. So a, a, a drug that would treat, um, let's think of something, uh, hay fever is going to have a different threshold for safety and effectiveness than a drug being looked at for a terminal form of cancer. And the FDA is trying to understand through this series of 20 meetings and other activities that it will sponsor how to make the risk-benefit tolerance equation acceptable for each of those 20 conditions. And that's really an important, um, an important factor in all of those steps in that infographic that we looked at. And, uh, you know, we heard uh, for those who participated either by webcast or in person at the FDA meeting in December where Amplogen um, was the focus. The outcome of that decision that the drug or that the, the uh, advisory committee voted that the drug was safe enough but the company had not done all it needed to do to show that it was effective. Um, you know, there were a lot of people who felt like, if it's safe, let me take the chance on effective and, you know, make the drug available on a broader basis than it is currently. So this risk-benefit tolerance is really going to be quite specific to every condition. And again, the uh, workshop in two weeks that the FDA is sponsoring will help inform the FDA about what our community's tolerance for risk and benefit is. Ultimately, it boils down to a very individual, personal decision that has to be made by the individual patient, his or her family, and the physician. But for the community as a whole, the FDA needs to have a stronger um, profile of what that risk-benefit tolerance is for making its regulatory decisions. And the other factor that kind of plays in here are the emotional barriers. Um, what you see over time in um, any chronic illness is that there can be emotional barriers to uh, seeking treatment and to accepting treatment and then to um, uh, following through on treatment. And in many conditions, if you look at rheumatoid arthritis, um, lupus, MS, the longer that a patient has a condition, they have different feelings about what they're willing to accept in terms of safety and effectiveness. Um, so again, these are just part of the equation and, and uh, you know, part of what the questions the FDA has asked and why.
So now that we've kind of broken down each word in that phrase, if we think about this infographic again, lined up from the drug development stage, where you might have a, a chemical or a compound in a flask or a Petri dish, all the way to it being on the shelf in a post-marketing environment, this is really you know, kind of the very basic four steps. So uh, once a compound is, is um, developed and tested in very early tests to make sure that it's safe to introduce into humans, you go through this clinical studies piece. If uh, that, those clinical studies are acceptable in terms of um, documenting both the safety and the effectiveness, the FDA will approve it. Then it's up to the sponsor of the drug, uh, usually a pharmaceutical company, to pr provide access to that drug by commercializing it. And you know, it's amazing uh, over the last year, I read a lot of pharmaceutical industry publications and daily emails, how many drugs there are that fail in this commercialization stage. Um, they price it wrong. They don't have the right distribution network. They don't have the manufacturing facilities to meet the demand. There are a lot of drug shortages, actually. But there are a lot of drugs that just simply don't make it once they get on the market. Um, there was an interview this morning on NPR with the CEO of uh, the company that has the new uh, MS drug that just got approved in the last couple of weeks, talking about the pricing for that drug. Uh, which I think is priced at about $50,000 a year, and how they came up with that figure and how long it will take to make back the R&D costs of millions and millions and millions of dollars that went into getting that drug approved. Um, so you know, while we all think that the, the last step is here with the FDA approval, it's really um, you know, a not trivial part of the process, the commercialization. And also the phase four studies, which are called post-marketing studies, to make sure um, that the FDA uh, watches a drug once it is made available to a much larger population than it would be during the clinical studies, that it continues to be safe and effective with wider use. And uh, you know, we can all point to examples of once a drug is out on the market and people are using it both for the intended purpose and also off-label for other potential uses. Um, that the drug is found not to be safe and is either added a black box warning onto the labeling or it's pulled from the shelves and recalled. Um, and then finally, is, as I was mentioning earlier about the patient reported outcome measures, you have over here in the white space the reimbursement side, um, both with private insurers and um, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare that are making decisions about whether to reimburse for particular therapies based somewhat on the FDA's assessment of safe and effective, but more and more based on how the patient does on that particular therapy and whether that patient is experiencing an improved quality of life as a result of that therapy. And they have to do that on a population basis, and they also have to do it on an individual basis, um, but we're seeing more uh, meta-analyses of HMO data to see if drug X is really helping prevent hospitalizations and other uh, consequences and other long-term health issues, um, and seeing now that drug company, or, I'm sorry, that insurance companies are changing their reimbursement strategies uh, based on uh, data, clinical data. So. Um, Everybody's very concerned about this issue and bringing the insurance uh, reimbursement aspect earlier into the decisions about what drugs get to market. So um, just to, to reiterate some points that Suzanne already uh, covered with the upcoming FDA workshop in two weeks, um, the meeting is open to the public. Uh, the first day will be dedicated to, it's actually a half day, gathering patients' perspectives on MECFS through a facilitated group discussion. And it will focus on two main topics, the disease symptoms and daily impacts that matter most to patients, 
and patients' perspectives on current approaches to treating ME-CFS. And I hope that the breakdown of that, that phrase, uh, safe and effective treatments for ME-CFS, helped you understand why the FDA is asking the questions that it is. Um, the disease symptoms and daily impacts that matter most help them frame whether you know, they let a manufacturer look at a particular drug that's going to treat a particular symptom. If it's something that patients haven't surfaced as being important in um, you know, how, how MECFS affects their lives, that drug may not be granted um, an IND uh, approval for the study. Um, it may determine what types of outcome measures the FDA guides the manufacturer to use in order to show that it's effective. And it may also influence, you know, if a drug has a particular side effect that is going to exacerbate something that's part of the illness complex, that may not be um, allowed to proceed at one point or another in, in that pipeline. And then knowing what the patient's perspective on what treatments are currently available helps also set that risk-benefit threshold. Um, right now, there are no approved therapies for MECFS, but if you look at platforms like Patients Like Me, and we'll soon have our own data set to go by, um, MECFS patients use some 800 different therapies to uh, address their symptoms and, you know, in hopes of finding some improved quality of life. So FDA has to sort of factor that in to um, how it sets the gates and the thresholds for manufacturers to proceed forward. The second day of the workshop will be more of a traditional um, scientific meeting that many of us are familiar with from, from watching the State of the Knowledge meeting or other uh, IACFS conferences, where there will be scientific discussion that will uh, include patients, clinicians, researchers, and government experts um, in a panel format where a speaker uh, like Suzanne will get up and give a talk on drug repurposing as part of a panel discussion, and then there will be, um, I think, some, some Q&A of the group uh, that's sort of centered around one set of topics. And they will also, in this day two, try to focus on quantitative outcome measures um, that will help the FDA assess whether symptoms improve with specific interventions. Not to dictate them, but to know what kinds of things will be reasonable to look at if a manufacturer proposes that. And again, just to reiterate, that the day one is the first session of the FDA's Patient-Focused Drug Development Initiative, the series of 20 disease-specific meetings um, that were announced, uh, the first 16 of which were announced today. The day one of the FDA workshop is the very first out of the gate of these sessions. And so the visibility for um, April 25th at the Marriott in Bethesda is going to be very high, not only because um, of the subject matter, but because now all of these other 16 communities or 15 communities are going to look at this to say, what can we expect when our turn comes? And, uh, you know, if there were 90 disease areas that wanted in on this set, there are going to be you know, 75 other groups that are saying, how can we get our name on the last uh, four of these meetings and what's going to go on at this MECFS workshop that we ought to, uh, you know, make sure we approach FDA with um, in our advocacy. Can't, I can't underestimate, I can't, you know, fail to say again what a major opportunity this is for our community and how much we hope you uh, will take advantage of it. Um, we've covered this. I won't labor too much on it. But the, the information that FDA is collecting, again, is to um, provide a better context for assessing drug applications, to understand the risk-benefit equation in MECFS, to define those outcome measures, to assess improvement um, in a particular drug study, and fourth, and perhaps maybe most importantly, is to provide an industry, uh, a roadmap for industry to develop and or repurpose potential therapies for testing MECFS. So one of the things that's become clear as Suzanne and I and others have had conversations with 
um, you know, Merck, GSK, uh, Sanofi about, you know, their interest in getting into drug development for MECFS is it's never easy for these companies to say they want to be first. There's a huge profit motive, but by and large, um, pharmaceutical companies, particularly in the year 2013, are very risk averse. They want to make sure they're not going down some unchartered territory that ends them up in a brick wall. Um, so if they have some sense of what the key features are of MECFS and how to measure improvement and what the patients most want to be um, relieved, it gives them a foothold that they haven't had previously. And we think this is going to be tremendously beneficial for um, getting interest uh, and getting more activity into that pipeline um, that right now is pretty anemic. Uh, once we have this roadmap and a guidance document from the FDA, it will spur drug development. We've seen this happen uh, in other conditions um, in the past. So this is all very good news and, uh, you know, again, a huge opportunity. So these are some ways for you, our community members, to participate in this process, even if you're not able to be in Bethesda on April 25th and 26th. The um, first way is the FDA docket, which is like a little uh, web window where you can answer the open-ended questions about symptoms and treatment that the FDA has posed directly to FDA. Um, and, you know, we encourage you to take advantage of all of these opportunities. If your energy and time is limited and you have to choose you know, one or, or the other, some of them may fit your particular inclinations better than others. Um, so you can submit directly to the FDA, and that way they have uh, unfiltered access to your experience. The association survey is constructed pretty much based on the FDA questions. We've also posed some additional questions on some topics that we thought were um, would be helpful to not only this particular uh, application, but perhaps in other policy and, and research settings as well. Our responses to our survey will be analyzed um, using natural language processing and parts of speech tools. Uh, we've contracted with an expert in this area to make sure that the analysis of that data isn't just done, you know, based on word search or uh, search bubble tools that may pick out the same word even if used in the opposite context. Um, we want to make sure that we get a clear understanding of what uh, you have submitted to us uh, and, you know, entrusted us to use uh, as feedback to the FDA. And we'll be presenting that data at the FDA uh, and hopefully also at the uh, CFS Advisory Committee. It's another forum for uh, influencing policy. Uh, two doctors, Dr. Lily Chu and Dr. Lenny Jason, have uh, also constructed a survey. They've used some similar questions to the ones that the FDA has posed, although they have put them into a multiple choice format. Um, so you, you have uh, two complementary approaches. Ours uses open-ended questions and lets you provide answers without any scripting or bias, and theirs gives you the prompts and aids that sometimes people need in order to recall uh, things fully and um, to, you know, have the little uh, cues that will um, assist in, in answering. And, of course, we recommend you, you do all of these again, but um, you, know, you might prefer one format or the other if you have limited time and energy. Uh, as Suzanne said, the workshop on April 25th and 26th will be webcast. It will be webcast live. There was um, a registration form that had to be completed by April 8th in order to register to participate either in person or by webcast. But we understand that if you have the URL on the day of the webcast, you'll be able to access the um, webcast even if you haven't pre-registered. So uh, we will do our best to make that URL available um, on the day of. And probably checking our Facebook page is the easiest way to get that if uh, we're able to share it. And then the webcast is, uh, I believe they plan to archive it on the FDA site, and you'll be able to watch that later if those dates uh, don't work out for you, if you have to 
you know, take a rest in, in between, um, those will be available, uh, the recordings will be available for posterity. So I think that brings us to the end. Suzanne, do you want to uh, give them a break from my voice and wrap us up? Sure, I would love to. Um, we have a little, for those of you who may have some questions, some live questions, if you look on the right side of your screen, you should see a little questions tab, and you can type in any questions that you might have that we could address now, or um, Kim and I will pick them up before we log off um, and make sure we get those addressed. Yeah, so I just see one actually here. I do want to just take a second to clarify. Um, somebody was asking, in the risk-benefit assessment, um, will FDA take greater risk with a more serious, debilitating, perhaps life-threatening condition than it will with um, a less serious condition? And I had used the hay fever versus terminal cancer scenario. Uh, and the answer is yes. They will. Um, you know, look at, you know, even a month of additional life expectancy in uh, a terminal cancer situation may lead to approval of a drug where, as, you know, that's not going to factor into a decision about hay fever because it's not life-threatening. So they do assign, um, do let riskier things go through with more side effects, more adverse events potentially in serious and life-threatening conditions versus things that don't fit that criteria. And CFS is in their serious uh, category, if you will, um, and they have reiterated that on now many occasions over the last year and a half. So, so Kim, I'm not seeing any questions on my end, so do you yeah. have any others that you want to? Mm, so they do not show up in answer to our yeah. Whether or not we were wondering if it was going to show up for me. Yeah. As many times as we've done these webinars, they keep changing the features. <laughs> okay, so maybe you might want to be sure, since we're after the hour now, yeah. you might want to be sure to take a look at them, cut and paste them into a document. No, we, we, we get them. There's a report we can generate. We okay, won't lose great. anything. Super. Um, and you want to hand me the controls? Yeah. I'll just wrap it up. OK. You should have them. All right. Well, once again, I'd like to thank everybody for taking this past hour or so to um, join us on this excellent presentation. Kim, that was just wonderful. It's the second time I've heard it, and I'm still learning every time I I, uh, we go through this stuff. It's just such a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to learn more and put it into context and to make sure that we uh, get it right. Next week's program, Mark Stone, pictured here on the left, our Director of Development, and I will be um, talking about how the CFIS Association is actually fostering the development of safe and effective treatments. We will share with you our roadmap for safe and effective treatment. So it should be um, exciting. We're very excited about it um, and, and interesting. That'll be our fourth and six programs for our spring series, and that's on Thursday, April 18th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. And here's the little registration URL um, if you want. And Kim, where is that uh, registration listed in addition to right here at the bottom? So, is that on Research First? It's on Research First. I think if you go to the next slide. Yeah. Um, you can find all of the webinars are in one um, Research First post, and the links to the registrations. And uh, we've been asked a few times if there's a way to sign up for the whole series at once. Sorry, GoToMeeting doesn't make that possible. Um, so you have to be a little repetitive. We apologize for that, but hopefully the free information is worth the uh, small amount of time it takes to register. Uh, and you'll also receive a follow-up email to today's program with the URLs. will include the Federal Register Notice that came out today and links to um, several pages on Research First where you can find other materials.
And please be sure to sign up for our Research First News. That's a free monthly newsletter. You can go to the Research First website and sign up for it there if you aren't already signed up. We also have a great presence on Facebook where every day we offer up new information and content and dialogue um, that just keeps getting better and better. Our community keeps getting bigger and bigger and more and more engaged. You can follow us on Twitter, our handle being at Please Solve CFS. And once again, on our YouTube page, uh, www.youtube.com slash SolveCFS. I just love hearing my scientific colleagues say her Twitter handle and know what that <laughs> means. <laughs> it certainly puts you in the 1% of scientists. <laughs> oh, I learned it from you, I know. Louise. <laughs> Stay tuned for the rest of our um, webinar series, too. We've got some great things in addition to what Mark and I are going to talk about next week. We've got some of our funded scientists also um, going to give us the latest and the greatest updates on epigenetics. Patrick McGowan from the University of Toronto, and Sanjay Shukla, who was one of our 2008 funded investigators, giving us um, some updates some really cool stuff on his work with the uh, microbiome in CFS. So again, those are all listed in our spring series, so please be sure to check them out and join us if you can. Um, is that you? No, that's not. Uh, it might be me. Sorry about that. that. Okay. There we go. So uh, once again, I would like to thank everyone for joining us and reminding you that you are our vision. We strive for a world free of MACFS and our mission, which we will accomplish, is to make MACFS understood, diagnosable, and, tre and treatable. And we're doing that by identifying safe and effective treatments for CFS, MACFS. We are strengthening our community by providing ways that all of us can engage and be active in, in, in this cause, this very important cause. And we are also working to aggressively expand funding for research that will lead, lead to safe and effective treatments. We do all of this with purpose, collaboration, respect, integrity, and last but not least, remarkable innovation. Thank you again. You are at the center of everything we do. I hope to hear you or see you or have you join us. I won't see you. I won't hear you even, but I hope to have you join us next week. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Suzanne. That was great. And we'll see you back next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. Have a <laughs> good afternoon and a nice weekend.